Hello everyone, it's Lennon. Welcome back to the channel. Today is officially my animism video, but more than that, it's going to be the isms, I guess, that I want to talk about. And all of this has come about, uh, the idea of wanting to get, the video idea for wanting to get my ideas about the isms out was a poetry book that I got a while ago now that has been knocking my socks off. And it's this beautiful book right here. Okay. And it's called, how does it feel to be you? An introduction to animism. Like this, this shade of a person here is so beautiful. Oh my God. And the author is Oshri. I think that's how you pronounce that. Oshri. I got this off of their website. Uh, and it came to me from Israel. Um, also, in the package for this book when it arrived, I got this photograph. That's an actual photograph of like a gorge with like a waterfall or something. And of course on the back there's like a little thank you note that they, that they you know, that they hand wrote. But this makes me miss photographs so bad. Oh my God. I have been taking for granted the the intangible reality in which we live, the intangible nature in which we photograph things now, how it's just so inherent now. We just pick up our phones, pow, 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 pow. We're, we're not, we don't have these like, you know, little mechanic, you know, these little, uh, you know, one hour camera things that you buy and it's got like 30 shots in it. And then you have to take it to a facility that will, that will print the photos for you. And even, I love the magic in that. There is such magic in real photographs because this was probably on a roll of film with 30 other images that this person didn't even remember taking, you know? Or maybe they did. I feel like every time I've taken one of those throwaway cameras to like the, you know, the department store and gotten them printed, half the pictures on there, I forgot that I took or someone picked up the camera and took a picture of um, of a day or a moment that we were having and someone saw the camera sitting there and they just <laughs> and then took a picture themselves you know and i didn't know it would be in there and i think that there's such tangible magic in that so the fact that they sent this photograph of a gorge to me with this book speaks a lot of the tangibility of uh of magic and what we can physically hold in our hands and how powerful this little photograph is and it and I really want to go buy a throwaway camera now and just take some randos and go print them out so that I can have physical copies of photos again you know like it, it can become lost it can become a bookmark right like th there is probably a thousand of these in these books postcards and photographs that I have used as bookmarks that are lost. But when you, that's, but when you open that book after years and years and find that photo, you're like, wow, wow, that, that is magic right there. So anyways, so this book right here has been knocking my socks off. I'm going to read something, uh, from it. It is important to mention that this book, written in words, might be or might have been considered by animus who did not develop written languages as both futile and dangerous. Futile because we are a part of an ever-changing and transient whole in which whatever should endure is recorded in tree rings, in soul layers, rock formations, and DNA strings. Dangerous because truth is always partial and always subjective and words narrow truth down even further. Oh my God, you guys, this person, this person, I don't know who they are, but this person, <laughs> I need to meet this person because there is like one atom in their DNA that matches mine. Okay. <laughs> and there's another, like there's, just, I keep, I keep drawing stars next to shit in this book and it is crazy. Okay. I wouldn't necessarily consider this poetry, even though it would, I guess if we place a genre down, it would be poetry, but, and it's not necessarily prose because it doesn't have a, like a set 
story that we're following. It is literally a stream of consciousness that matches my own. Okay. So this is how the book is written. Very much in sections. Like this person had a thought. And oh, here's another thought. Oh, here's another thought. And it's almost like we're following the pauses that this person had while writing this book. Like an actual moment of hesitation. A moment of realization. A moment of trying to get the words just right. When it's, it's abysmal the amount of pause and hesitation, but not an annoying amount. It's, it's just the right amount. And it matches, like, you can always tell when the person stops to think and they're, and they're, and they're like sitting there like daydreaming. And then they go back to the typewriter. Like this is written in a stream of consciousness way that I adore that I want to keep doing because it kind of inspires me to take the same liberties with it. Why is it that in so many children's books, everything has a face? <laughs> Why do trees, houses, cars, rivers, and practically every object that is a teaching element in the story have some sort of individual character? Is it only a method of teaching children around the world because they lack the ability to think abstractly? Or is it also that they still re retain an inborn capability to relate to the world straightforwardly? To communicate with all things as if all things have faces. I just cannot explain. I can't explain what this book is doing to me, but it's changing me. It's submitting my views, but changing me in big, in big, big, big ways. Okay. I'm going to use the photograph that sent me as a bookmark, which I've been doing, <laughs> so that it can be forgotten and then found in divine, divine magic. Okay. So it's been knocking my socks off, but it really has me thinking on animism as a whole and the umbrella terms, the isms, and what my belief structure is. Uh, what my worldviews are, and then what I believe in terms of universality, because worldview is very, to me, is very limiting when we're talking about the isms, okay? The way I was brought up, I was brought up in a very strict uh, Christian sect, okay, I'll say. I was raised Southern Baptist, which is a form of, of Christianity that's here in the South, okay? Baptism that's here, in the, uh, ba uh, baptistry that's here in the, in the South, it made me think in hierarchical structure, okay? And I never liked that. Where God was at the top and then the bottom of the pyramid would be like the sea, right? Like here's the sea, here's plant life, here's animals, here's humans, here's uh, angels and things like that, and then here's God, you know? And then it would be like this weird-ass pyramid of whatever. And I never liked that in the teachings and in the sermons that I would go to, it all seemed to be this pyramid scheme quite freaking literally. When I uh, branched away from, well, first branched away from religion in general, and we're not really going to get into that because I've made videos on that before on the channel. Healing from religion, uh, I may leave that up here so you can get a little bit of a, uh, as to what I have, you know, ways in which I've, I've tried to heal myself. Uh, even though I I believe that certain religious trauma, especially what I, I endured is, is uh, like one of those lifelong things that you're just going to have to keep trudging through. But it's something that, you know, you kind of, you're always going to, you know, you're always dealing with. Uh, so it's definitely something that's just like there over there to the side. Okay. So what I essentially did upon leaving religion as a whole and then trying to build a spiritual practice because I always knew I needed a spiritual practice because of the way my mind worked, I knew I needed a spiritual practice. And then, so as I was building my spiritual practice, I started to go, okay, well, if this is what I've been taught, you know, if this is what I've been, uh, been taught, this pyramid scheme of, uh, you know, religiosity over here, let's go to the farthest back we can. That's what I did. I went, what's the earliest religion? Animism is a modern term. In, it is my belief and a lot of philosophical uh, the, the, theologians and things like that uh, and people of in the almost 
theology academics would deem that animism is a modern term. But back in the time that we would deem animistic time frame, uh, an animistic time frame, religion wasn't necessary. There wasn't a separation between the divine and man or the earth and heaven, you know? There wasn't this separation. Everyone knew that there was this inherent uh, divinity within all things. So wh whatever the ism would have been. We've, we've placed the term animism on those, those peoples of those times that didn't have a separation. And there wasn't a need for an organized religion. Religion, a term meaning, uh, I believe that the term religion means connection. It does mean connection in, I mean, I can't tell you the actual definition, but I know that religion as a term means connection. But back in those times, there wasn't a separateness. Everything was like this. Over the course of time, ag uh, uh, urbanization, modernization, agriculture, all that just kind of, mm, we did this, right? And then we started, because there was a separation, we started fighting against each other. So there was, so therefore religion started natural. It was a natural uh, thing that began because it, we humans needed this again. So that's why religion came about in my opinion, okay? And so there, there is a, I guess a need, there is a need for religion. I went down rabbit holes with animism because I believed in the togetherness of all things, natural made things. I believed in animal Monday. I believed in this, the concept of breath. And I believed in the concept of oneness. And I believed in the concept of there not being a hierarchy, a hierarchy. There not being a structure. There not being really a difference between uh, the sea Okay, and the plant life and the bacteria and me and the deities I work with and the, the, the angels and the demons and the blah, blah, blah. And then the source over all, all of it. <laughs> I didn't necessarily believe that all of this needed to be compartmentalized and separated. So I adhered to the term animism. Side note here. We could say that I was I wanted to be an animist when I saw Pocahontas. Okay. Now I'm not going to go into the, like the Disney, the Disney part of the Disney aspect of, uh, like what bad Disney is doing. Okay. I, but I was of the age where I watched Disney films. Okay, so that is my age. And so therefore, as a small, <clears throat> as a child, I would have watched the Disney movies. And I did watch Pocahontas. Now, what Pocahontas watching that movie did, hearing Colors of the Wind, seeing Grandmother Willow, this made me, this was the first step into animism that I actually had. Okay, in the back of my head, I was like, I want to see the Colors of the Wind. I can see the Colors of the Wind. You know, I need my ritual tree, which if you're not a stranger to my channel, you'll know I had a, what I call a ritual tree in my backyard, this huge monstrosity of a sweet gum tree that I would climb from about three years old up until my teenagehood. I would climb the damn thing daily and sit and meditate and daydream. And ugh, it was like a ritualized sacred space for me. Okay. To be in this tree. And so um, God, it seems like a life, lifetime ago now. I needed my ritual tree to be Grandmother Willow. I needed there to be this like face that would just awaken when I would climb it and talk to me. And uh, very much in my imagination, it did. It, it, happened, it happened that way one winter day. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it happened. It very much happened that way in my imagination. And so that was kind of my first step. Pocahontas was my first step into animism, I guess you could say. And probably the first pushback I had against the, the hierarchy of the religion that I was brought up in. Now, one thing, again, that animism taught me, like, it, through research and through uh, various rituals I've had in the 
you know, over a decade of practice I have in, uh, in my witchcraft, spiritual, spiritual practice, I guess you could say. What it's made me realize is the, I needed the, the togetherness of it, of us all. Basically, I have been exploring the uniqueness of persons, which tells me about their separateness, but then because of animism and the way I form some relationship with that word and, you know, that, that, that word, I want to find a way to connect the uniqueness of us all. What I am doing is mapping my own structure, okay, which is perfectly okay to do. I'm mapping my own structure because technically I can't, I'm not one of the ones that can adhere to someone else's set of rules on a, a topic as huge as spirituality. So I had to kind of make my own. And that's kind of what this video is, like mapping out my own, like, you know, having all kinds of isms. But the way in which I mapped out the fact that we're all unique and that separates us, but then how to reconnect all of us is through my, uh, through my understanding of souls. I often talk on the channel about the web of life, how we're all kind of connected. Now, I believe that the soul, okay, is like this light. All right, let's just call it light. This light that lives inside of us that... Eh, I don't know how to explain it. This this light that lives inside of us and that light is connected to someone else's light and someone else's light and someone else's light. And then it just all blossoms into like, we're all connected on the web of life, the web, the web of fate. And it's through, it's through this light that we find common grounds with other people. Much like, much like my experience with this. I believe that there's something in this person's soul that matches mine. And it's because on the web of life, there's this tiny, tiny iridescent string that is linking us both. And how beautiful is that? On the other side of the world, even in Israel, that's, that's beautiful. That's, that's beautiful right there. Okay. That's sacred. But this concept of souls led me, <clears throat> this concept of animism that led me to the soul work of the separateness and togetherness. Okay. And the uniqueness of, of us all led me into the pantheism and panentheism. Pantheism would be like God is the universe. God, capital G, whatever that is to you. Source, whatever. Um, God, capital G, is the universe. And then panentheism is the universe lives inside of God with a capital G. There was some aspects of pantheism that I, that I, I liked, right? That, that this, this concept that everything, that everything shares something, that we all kind of share a little part of the divine, right? Like we're pieces of a big jigsaw puzzle, again, like the web of life. But then, like, I like the, I kind of like the concept of pantheism in the, the concept of pantheism in which we all derive from the same source. But it doesn't have to be source or God with a G. It could just be this essence, right? Like we're all, we all flow from this one, one light source, right? Like someone's shining a flashlight on the web of life. And then all of our souls are like those beautiful little jeweled water beads that are on a spider web. And it's shining how it shines on all of them, you know, and the light, it, the light is there on the web, right? Even so far as to say that we came, we came from chaos, right? This concept of chaos, I guess you could say. Like all is God. I believe in the uniqueness of each, of, of each soul, okay? Which is an animism thing. And then for pantheism, I really liked this concept of God being the universe. But that there's no real, pantheism would not posit that there's a uniqueness to an individual thing, person, okay? And so I was like, mm, okay. And then that led me to panentheism, which is this concept of the universe being a manifestation of God. And therefore, God, in I guess in this context, would have been above the universe, like 
the here's the universe and here's God over top of it, you know, like raining down. <laughs> now, for panentheism, I liked the, the concept of the universe being some sort of manifestation of, of God with a capital G, but not necessarily in the, hierar in the hierarchy. So I kind of believed in it being like, I liked the, the whole thought patterning behind in the universe being a manifestation of source, but not necessarily believing in the hierarchy of God, like God somewhere up at the top here, much like my pyramid from growing up. I, I think I liked the panentheism for its ability to make me think of God in this or source, really, source energy, source source energy, this essence of God, with a capital G, as being like beyond space and time. This idea that whether or not the hierarchy is there, it is almost like this unknowable aspect to the universe. And that's what panentheism made me realize about my own practice and my own belief structure around what I, what I believe source energy is. But then that led me into this other pan, <laughs> which is called panpsychism. Now, panpsychism is something that I believe Crowley would have been a fan of, <laughs> as a fan of Crowley myself. Basically, that ideas play a role in the universe. Like will, willpower is ubiquitous. Whether or not I'm a manifestation of the divine or if I'm divine in and of itself, uh, like a, you know, a piece of the big jigsaw puzzle that is divinity, that my will, that my will and my ideas and my, everything that I would, everything that I would put out into tangible reality has to have a place in, in an ism. Like somehow something beyond matter that would have divinity as well. And that's really interesting to think about the fact that my willpower at the essence of me in my soul, in this light, there would be this willpower that drives me, okay, and that drives my, uh, that has driven my experiences and that it will inevitably have this motion behind it, okay, that's, that's pushing me in terms of experience, ideas, decisions, all that. And that in and of itself would have to have a divinity of itself as not separate from me, but within me. So we, it's kind of like, instead of it being a pyramid, it's this gigantic, unfathomable circle. And it's just going in, 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 to another abysmal, uh, not even abysmal because there's no up and down here. Okay. But this, this, the center being the soul, like this light and the center. And then it, it grows and, and ebbs and grows like this. But then the outside of this would be this unfathomable nothingness, you know? So I really liked that about panpsychism. And I think Crowley would have liked panpsychism as well, had he had known what it was or if he did or not, you know? But this ebb and this undulating aspect of our being, okay, of our beings, uh, led me into interiority. This concept that no matter what, inside we're all the same. Now, isn't that the golden thing that, parents told all children that the outside doesn't matter. It's, it's the inside that counts. Right. But I believe that this is, a, this is like spiritual shit. Okay. This, <laughs> this is a, a concept that's not trying to get kids to share. Okay. Interiority is this like philosophy that really we are all the, the same on the inside. And again, that goes back to panpsychism where it's like, but the decisions I've made may change my interiority. Okay. Do I drink? Well, then my liver's going to look different than someone else's that doesn't. Do I smoke? My lungs are going to look different. Am I a runner? My, the muscle structure of my legs, the tears, the scar tissue, the, um, all of those derive from decisions and from genetics and from certain, certain things that our body has been through. Right. But that goes back on to will and how that has to have a divinity of itself because it plays a role in our uniqueness. Just mind blowing. Now let's get back to animism for just a second. Animism to me isn't necessarily a belief structure and neither is my views on pan and panentheism or panpsychism. 
really. Uh, it's more an experience. I think that when I, what I've learned through my decade long witchcraft spirituality practice is that I don't necessarily find the need to label my knapsack anymore. In terms of a relationship with myself, in terms of a relationship with spiritual, my spiritual practice and the concept of spirit, the concept of source, the concept of divinity and chaos, in order to have a relationship with them, I have to have experiences with them. You know, it does me no good to just read about it all the time, to write poetry about it all the time, to daydream about it all the time. I really need to have some experiences and what animism overall has done for me is allowed me to experience spirit. Essentially all three terms have allowed me to do is experience the natural world as subjects, not objects. In this monotonous short existence that we humans have, animism, pantheism, and panentheism have allowed me to hold wonder. There's widespread disenchantment on this universal scale and how it's through my spiritual and witchcraft practice that I want to gain and ex I want to gain experiences and knowledge and wisdom, I guess, with everything. And I don't want to be disenchanted. I want to continue to be enchanted by things that I do experience. Labeling the practice in this in these ways has provided me a discernible way in which to form bonds. Now, all this to me seems very spiritual in nature, right? Like. I have to be woo, 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 woo up here uh, in the clouds for any of this to make sense. That's kind of what I'm feeling right now. But to be honest, I really wanted a relationship with source and chaos and the unknowable. Okay. But that let these, uh, trying to find out how I feel about the isms, these three isms, Four, whatever, four, four isms. <laughs> um, it led me to find out what my belief structure is around the idea of source, you know, and divinity as a whole. Do I believe in such things? Do I believe in a beginning and an ending? Do I believe that if we were created, there has to be a point of origin and then there needs to be a point of ending, right? But then I believe that the science, that, okay, if we look at science uh, for a little bit and that some as someone who's interested in, in uh, the science of the universe, then I, I, I believe that there's such a fluidity within the, the, the universe, okay? On Earth and in, out there in space, okay? There's death and birth and rebirth on, on every scale. How then could source be this fixed point if this if we live in an ever evolving, ever changing universe, and then we are complex and ever evolving and ever changing as well, depending on our experiences throughout the course of this short existence that we have, then why wouldn't source have that same fluidity? And so therefore I've been grappling with source as this fluid thing, you know, like almost corporeal and what that may mean. I cannot understand myself, sir, for I am not myself. Um, I love the Alice in Wonderland quote because it speaks to the transient beauty of nature, humans, humans being part of that, that, I mean, if you imagine we have 60 years on this planet and the universe is how old that's fleeting, fleeting beauty right there, finding out what we can put back into this. 14 billion year, you know, universe when we only have this like minute amount of time, you know, and all this led me to another ism, which is pandeism and pandeism is this, I guess, I guess another philosophical idea of transience versus eminence. Is there a transcendence of being or an eminence of being? You know, when I think about source and I think about this, it being this fluid thing, I, I, I have to ask myself the questions about whether or not I believe 
that source, God with a capital G, would would create this universe and then abandon it, like in the Supernatural uh, TV series? <laughs> or is it all a game? You know, like we're just this giant chessboard, right? Or, <laughs> or did God with a capital G create the universe and then when it was created, he became it? I think that that is something powerful that I'm exploring right now is pandeism. Um, do I believe that God is out there, you know, X-Files style or, you know, just like ignoring us, uh, being this, you know, discompassionate being that created us. Did he create everything and then just, did he create everything and then just kind of like, you know, morphed into it and became it pandeism style. So that's something that I've been exploring, which is, at some, you know, in some respects and in some very specific things, I believe in the transients, right? There, there has to be something beyond the physical, beyond the tangible, beyond, uh, even those things that have yet to be discovered in terms of our universe. Okay. In terms of science in our universe, that still fit. There's still physicality there. Okay. Physicality that we will someday know about. Uh, so, but I believe that there's, there is something beyond that, beyond the physicality, the, beyond the physicality of the universe, but then also eminence, like that everything would have that in it. <laughs> now, one thing too, is when we, when I think about source, I'm a dualist. I, I consider myself a dualist that every time I have a thought, I have to have a thought on the opposite end. Okay. So when I think of source, I have to think of man and not necessarily that I believe that we're the complete opposite of source. Okay. But I'm just saying, because I am a human, I think in that realm, like if I were a dog, I'd probably think like a dog, you know? So, um, if I was cursed with consciousness, okay. I think about the emanation of man, like how, like I said before, we're this undulating circle of being here, okay? Whether or not I believe we're separate or together with source, we're this undulating circle of things here where we're just like going into the light and out of the light and into the light and out of the light. And it's just like this, this constant flow. I think a powerful maxim that at least we have in witchcraft is as above, so below. That's what it makes me think of, this undulating circle of eminence that man has. Which, which is what transcendence and eminence made me think of. Matter is within life and life is within the mind. And then the mind is within the soul. And then the soul is within the spirit. And then spirit is within the one, whatever that is, whatever the whole, the whole is. You know? And it's weird because I go back and forth be between whether or not I believe spirit and source to be part of me, but then also separate. You know, I'm going to read this Bible verse to you guys because I wrote it down in my handy dandy notebook here and it really has been making me think, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed, you're there. That is Psalms 139.7. How then are we going to put a place as like heaven out there if you're here, if you're inside of me? You know, it's been, it's took, it's taken a lot of time for me to understand the isms. It's going to take even more time to keep my feelers out. I feel like my fishing net is always out in the ocean of my spirituality, in the ocean that is my spirituality, constantly out trying to catch snippets of information, experiences, and a felt presence. There is a universal order to all, and we are all bound by its laws. Chaos can be equated to the uncontrollable, those unknowable aspects of the universe that will forever be fathomless. And I want a relationship with it all. Okay. 
And there are some thoughts on the isms from Little Lowly Linen, okay? <laughs> I will leave the uh, link to Oshri's book down below. Check it out if you're interested. And let me know your thoughts on the isms if you, ha you know, if you, you know, if you have any. Um, also, if you want me to expand on anything about my idea about what God with a capital G is or what source is. Uh, and a little, I, I, I kind of want to, if y'all are interested, let me know on touching on my relationship to the concept of God with a capital G and, and religion, because I'm kind of, while reading this, reading, um, this, which is called A Cloud of Unknowing and the book of Privy Council, which is by this anonymous author in the 14th century, that is a book on contemplative prayer and how to do it. And I don't know who wrote this. No one does. But it's pretty good if you can get back past the religiosity of it. Okay. And so learning from the Christian mystics is something that I've always been, that I've always done on top of modern things like this. So if y'all want me to expand a little on anything, just let me know in the comments. And I will be back for more. Hope everyone's having a great day. Much love.